All right. Okay. So um, I think it's time. So let's get started. Um, well, um, thank you all for being here. You know, I'm really glad to see so many people are interested in this topic. And uh, um, you know, uh, KubeCons have you know early deadlines for the uh, for the talk. So when I submitted the talk, I want to talk about log processing. But when I thought about it, when I write up the the slides, I thought you know it's really about stream processing, not just limited logs, about other things. So you know, uh, my name is Michael Yuan, and I'm the maintainer of CNCF's um, uh, WebAssembly runtime project called Wasm Edge. So that's a, a GitHub link if you're interested. You know, um, visit us. Um, on GitHub, you know, there's uh, essentially all our activities happening over there. <clears throat> so, um, as you can see the title, you know, there's two seemingly unrelated technologies that are being mentioned in the same sentence, WASM and eBPF. You know, um, <clears throat> if, I <clears throat> if I ask people, most people would just know they're both um, lightweight virtu virtual machine formats, but how are they related? You know, that's, that's you know, we're going to dive into that. And uh, we're going to even go further. You know, we're going to, uh, towards the end of this talk, uh, we can also talk about things like uh, you know um, uh, AI and machine learning, which seem to be the, the the topic of this conference, right? How does that relate to say WASM and eBPF and uh, the whole idea of stream processing, right? You know, so there's a lot of topic we're going to cover. Um, I do have some um, some demos, but I don't think we all have time to do the live demo here. So I'm going to give you the link, and uh, um, and you can you know go home and do that from your hotel room. You know, that's, I think, it also would be more friendly to the, to the conference bandwidth, right? So, <clears throat> you know, um, from the conversation that I had uh, yesterday and the, the, the day before that, um, it seems like um, a lot of people <clears throat> are not really familiar with, say, the cloud-native WASM idea, you know, so WebAssembly sounds like something you use in the browser, you know, how's that, how's that related with, you know, um, uh, cloud native computing, and what do you mean? What do we mean by, you know, um, Wasm on the server side? So, this um, this whole idea goes all the way. So, I added a couple of slides at the beginning of this talk, right? So, this is one of the slides that I added. So, the idea goes all the way back to the origin of the cloud computing, right? You know, so the cloud is really, you know, sharing resources with other people you know, uh, on, the, on, on the larger computer, you know, so there's no cloud, it's just running programming other people's computer, right? So the whole idea of this is that the, the enabling technology really is isolation and virtualization. That's why, you know, the, the um, you know, the clouds grow up with, say, AWS, you know, that's uh, VMware, you know, this generation of companies that provide virtualization and isolation on workloads. And uh, the evolution of the, um, of the isolation, virtualization goes, uh, you know, um, from our point of view, goes through three phases. The first is the uh, virtual machine era, so where you have, you know, hypervisor and, you know, things like that. And uh, that is where um, the cloud computing first come up, right? You know, you rent uh, VPS uh, virtual machines from, say, um, you know, ISPs or even AWS, right? You know, that's a lot of original cloud provider using this technology. And um, um, after a couple of years, um, Docker came along and uh, Container came along. You know, that's, uh, people find you don't need to wrap, say, uh, operating system and then give people root access to install multiple applications. You can containerize each application in their own container. So deploy a lot of those. And uh, that's, I think that's the crust of cloud native, right? You know, cloud native is to say, there's a lighter weight and a more flexible way of running workloads that in isolation, right? So that's the container era, which, um, you know, is, um, I think, is the era we're currently in, although towards the end of it, I think, you know, so that's uh, um, to make application and workload in a container, right? So what's the next uh, generation after container? Because container, why, why tell people a container is a heavyweight solution? Most people are very surprised, you know, especially in KubeCon. People say containers are lightweight sort of solutions. You know, you are, you know that's uh, uh, because they are comparing that with virtual machine, right? But if we compare com container with a new generation of uh, virtual machines, um, you know, we, we call application virtual machines, though, uh, which happens not at the application level isolation, but as the function level isolation, you know, meaning that I no longer just isolate an entire application, but I isolate a function in the application, right? You know, so that's what we call the WASM area, because that's where the, um, the, 
the lightweight virtual machine that is even lighter than the container, orders of magnitude lighter than the container, can play an important role. So that's so if people ask what's Wasm on the server side. Wasm on the server side is even ever smaller granulation, ever small uh, finely green isolation level for applications. You know, we go from the whole computer to an application on the computer to a function in the application, right? You know, so um, Wasm would be able to, um, um, you, you know, um, uh, provide uh, security and isolation for those for, for those very small workloads, right? So the whole idea of um, you may think, you know, that's okay, that's, you are describing microservices. Although traditional definition of microservices is not that. Traditional definition of microservices is, um, you know, uh, 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 application service that wrapped in a, in a container, right? However, if you look at um, uh, how those um, uh, today's microservices are being run in a, in, in a data center, you would find that, uh, you know, a large percentage of the, uh, the, the uh, utilization is spent on things that are at the function level, it's, uh, things that, that are transit, you know, that's things that are very short-lived. But um, with the um, uh, container paradigm, you have to start a container for all those. You know, if you, if you think about how you set up a Kubernetes cluster, you know, there's everything is a container, even the wait action, doing nothing and wait is a container, right? You know, that's a, so um, for all of those, you need to spin up the operating system, the virtualized environment and all that. So, you know, um, um, uh, to a lot of people, this is, uh, um, this, as microservices goes f more and more finely green, it becomes more and more problems. You know, so we have worked with uh, large internet companies that has 50,000 microservices. You know, it's not 50,000 machines. It's 50,000 different services. Each service has a team to maintain and has its own machine to provision, right? You know, so it's, uh, the, the, you know, the, the spread of microservices has really put a lot of strain on the, uh, on the infrastructure, right? That leads to, uh, you know, a very interesting um, uh, exchange, I think, from last year, I mean, I hope maybe two years ago, you know, so when uh, Elon Musk acquired Twitter, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, he was looking to very aggressively cut cost. And, uh, you know, so he was thinking, aloud, uh, thinking out aloud at the time. A lot of people thought he was, um, you know, this was crazy. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, you can't um, move from a microservices environment overnight to to something that is not a microservice. But, you know, that's, uh, uh, although, um, you know, um, Twitter as we know it is still, exi still exists, right? And this hasn't crashed yet, you know? So, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, um, from outside, a lot, there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, people have a lot of uh, resentment in terms of, you know, how um, uh, the microservices paradigm is being abused, right? You know, that's uh, um, to putting everything um, every minute function into a container and then make it um, uh, uh, as part of the heavyweight infrastructure is, um, you know, is, I think, rob people the wrong way, right? You know, so that's why he had this tweet and to say that he's going to turn off 80% of the microservices and, you know, the, 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 the website needs to still be functioning, right? You know, that's, uh, it was, uh, it was very interesting because that's the, uh, at the time, you know, you would see Twitter has um, random failures. For instance, the two fact, two, uh, you know, the the, the two-factor authentication would fail because there is a microservice that's responsible for sending out the SMS, right? You know, and uh, he shut that down. That uh, you know, the two-factor authentication was suddenly not working, right? You know, so it's uh, gradually they fix all those problems. But you know, that's uh, uh, it is one of those um, uh, very high-profile, I would say, um, uh, you know, objections to this whole paradigm of having too many containers and too many uh, services that's, uh, that clutter up the whole infrastructure, right? So, we, um, so in, in, the, in, the, in, in the language of the cloud native computing, you know, we position Wasm as another container runtime, you know, so we, we often call Wasm as a container, you know, that's, although it's not really a container, it's, uh, it doesn't give you an uh, operating system. It has a very confined set of uh, functionalities that you have to write your application to that specification in order to take advantage of it, right? However, if you do that, if you use, um, you know, um, if you write applications in, um, to the Wasm API and then compile to Wasm, the benefit you get is, uh, first of all, it's very lightweight. You know, it's, uh, uh, as I will demonstrate in a minute, it's about two orders of magnitude smaller than the comparable container images. You know, that's, uh, so we are going from, as I will show you in a minute, 
tens of megabytes or even hundreds of megabytes container images to ones that measured in kilobytes, okay? So a database application can now become kilobytes in Wasm. You know, that's, uh, so um, when we had those screenshots on Twitter, you know, people were very shocked, you know, that's, uh, so we have a three-tier web application that has a MySQL background, has a web server, and uh, the total size of the application is 700 kilobytes, okay? You know, so it's, uh, um, so, but exchange, you have to use, um, you know, um, um, maybe a new language, a Rust, or maybe a new SDK, you know, to rewrite your application this way, right? And uh, it's going to go a lot faster than spinning up a container, you know, that's, uh, or, or spinning up, uh, spinning up, spinning up a, a Linux container. So it would be, um, again, one or two orders of magnitude faster, not at runtime, but at startup. That allows it to scale to zero, meaning in a lot of container settings, because it takes like close to one second to start up a container, in order to ensure that response always happens in milliseconds, you have to have the container running all the time. You have to keep it in the, in the, uh, uh, in the memory or, or, or have a dedicated CPU to it. It's called keep warm, right? You know? But with Wasm, you can truly scale to zero, meaning you run nothing. When, when this task is not needed, right? You know, so it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's truly startup on demand, right? Because in Wasm, it's in a, uh, in a host environment, it's just a starting up a thread. You know, there's no um, um, additional overheads that you have to load all those, mem all those libraries and, you know, things like that. And uh, Wasm can arguably be more secure because it is a, uh, it is a new security paradigm that, that, that's, uh, that's, um, what they call capability-based security, meaning that you have to explicitly declare what you, um, uh, what this container or this application you have access to, right? It's unlike, say, um, a regular container application. And as we all see when we talk about eBPF, is that a lot of things ask for the root permission. You know, so, you know, you don't really want that. You know, that's, uh, uh, so in, in, the, uh, in Wasm, there's more finely grained way for you to, for you to do those things. And perhaps, more interesting and uh, very interesting today is that Wasm application is truly portable. Uh, traditional container applications are not truly portable because when you look at the container images, they have x86, they have ARM, you know, ARM CPU, you know, you have at least those two distinctions, which is okay if you only have two CPUs. However, more and more workload we see today runs on GPUs and other specialized hardwares. So if you look at PyTorch Docker image, it has different image for different version of CUDA and different version of CUDA. So there's hundreds of images and each of them has, a, uh, has slightly different, you know, um, um, uh, uh, you know, external driver version that's, that's being version to external drivers, right? That's really one of the big challenges in today's um, uh, cloud native computing is that Kubernetes is designed to distribute binary artifacts. It's not designed to recompile your source code on your deployment machine because it assumes that the binary artifact is somewhat portable. And uh, with the new, um, that's why I want to talk about AI in a minute, that's with uh, new AI and ARM workloads. That promise has been broken, you know, because, you know, um, say if I develop, uh, uh, even if a Python application, you have to specify whether underneath it you want to use a CUDA driver or something else, right? You know, so if I develop something um, on the Mac, there's no guarantee that this, this same application is going to work on uh, a video machine in the cloud. There's no guarantee that this, this, this application is going to work in, say, the AWS specialized inference chip, that's called Inferon, I think, you know. So you are going all the way back to pre-Java days, 25 years ago, where you developers have to recompile and test their applications on the deployment platform, you know. So I think that's um, um, is also one of the features that was uh, significant features was going to give us is that uh, it's truly portable. You know, it's just one binary. It's uh, OS independent, CPU independent, with machine learning and AI workloads. It's GPU independent. So you know, you can just uh, you can truly run it anywhere. So those are the um, some of the features. So you know, so those are the things that I talked about, right? You know, so uh, if you, I know it's a little hard to read, but you know. Um, we have, um, um, you know, at around that time, we, 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 we published um, uh, the, I wouldn't call the benchmarks, but, you know, some, some numbers of, you know, uh, some applications that we built, right, you know. So all those applications is some kind of web service. It has a, uh, has a you know, it runs a web server, so you can access it from outside. And uh, it has some kind of database on the back end. The database could be MySQL, could be Redis, Redis could be Postgres. And uh, 
if you use the um, a traditional way to, let's not say Java, because Java is hundreds of megabytes, but if you, if you use Go to write, or Rust to write those applications, and wrap, wrap them around in, a, uh, say, a Ubuntu image, the, 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 the container size would be in uh, tens of megabytes. But um, here we can see that, uh, you know, um, the WASM size, the entire application is about, I think, 700 kilobytes or 800 kilobytes. You know, it's that, you know, a sub, one meg um, sub one megabytes, you know, so it's that. The difference is huge. The difference is at least one order of magnitude, oftentimes two orders. So, <clears throat> well, it's not just us that says that, you know, so uh, the CNCF annual survey said, um, what did they say? Oh, containers are the new normal and the WebAssembly is the future. I think that's why, you know, that's why they say it, right? You know, so, <clears throat> so <clears throat> a little word about, um, you know, the WASMH project. The WASMH project is a CNCF, uh, it's only a WASM runtime project in CNCF, you know, so there's other WASM application project, like WASM Cloud is actually the application server that build on WASM, right? You know, so, um, in, um, um, but WASM Edge is the actual runtime, right? You know, so it is a, um, what we call a cloud native uh, purpose built um, a web assembly runtime for, for server side applications. And uh, <clears throat> it has a lot of features that are important on the server side, but not important in the browser, right? So for instance, it can create HTTP servers. And uh, in order to create HTTP servers, you need um, asynchronous connections because you can't, you know, <clears throat> think Node.js. Node.js is a single threaded uh, HTTP server. You can have multiple connections coming at the same time, but they are on the same thread, but they can share time because they, they do not block each other, right? So we do the same thing with, uh, with Wasm Edge starting HTTP servers in it, right? You know? So we support database connections. We can connect out to MySQL or Postgres and you know, a variety of different databases as we have seen from the, from the, other, uh, from the previous tweet, right? You know, so build three tier architecture applications, the, the, ser the web server, the middleware, and the database, right? We support a lot of AI workloads, which we're gonna talk about later, you know, including PyTorch, TensorFlow, Llama.cpp, and you know, things like that to provide a cross-platform AI experience for the, um, for the um, you know, for our applications. And uh, <clears throat> perhaps more interesting is that we support existing container tooling, meaning that within t uh, today, you can use Kubernetes or Cryo or CRON or uh, elements of the, or even Docker desktop to directly manage Wasm Edge applications as if they are Linux containers. And we're gonna show that in a minute, right? You know, so that's one of the advantages of um, playing this ecosystem, playing the CNCF ecosystem, is that we get um, other tools to support, you know, um, a deployment of, of Wasm applications. So let's see how it works in, um, because this is a question I get a lot, you know, in Kubernetes. <coughs> uh, as we have just mentioned, the Kubernetes container, um, uh, Linux container for, Linux containers are not, uh, uh, are not truly cross-platform. So you need to give it a CPU architecture, right? You know, it's x86 or ARM64, you know, whatever. So there's a new um, CPU architecture called WebAssembly, WASM32, okay? So when you, when you have a WASM binary artifact, you build a WASM application to build a WASM binary bytecode application, sort of like a Java bytecode application, right? You can upload it to Docker Hub and give it uh, the CPU label as WASM32. When the um, Kubernetes tools like CRON or ContainerD plus, plus a shim plus RONWASI um, pulls that artifact from the Docker Club. It checks the CPU architecture, uh, um, CPU architecture to see if it can run locally. Now it sees it's WASM32. It's, there's no corresponding CPU that can run WASM32. At that point, the tool knows that it needs to use a WASM runtime to run it, right? You know, so at that point, it start WASM Edge and run it. So for uh, for uh, developers, it is a fairly straightforward experience. You know, is that you can run Linux containers and WASM WASM applications side by side in the same cluster. So you have a pod that has maybe three Linux containers running as a servers and two WASM um, applications that running as um, as serverless functions or something like that, right? So it's a uh, um, 
this experience, of course, still needs to be, um, is continuously being improved, you know, so we have, um, you know, uh, the partners that we work with, like Liquid Reply, you know, they have a KWASM project that has a, has a Kubernetes operator that's automatically installed WASM runtime on the cluster and, you know, things like that. So there's lots of things that's, uh, that happen in this space, but the general idea is that we define the new CPU format called WASM32 that doesn't really exist in the, in the real world, but when the uh, Kubernetes runtime sees that, it knows to use the WASM Edge runtime to run it. Okay. So here are the, some of the database connections that we support. You know, that's, we are going to go over that. So, you know, that's um, with all the introduction about what is WASM and, you know, things like that. You know, so we, 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 we can finally talk about some use cases, right? You know, so the first use case we want to talk about is WASM for streaming functions. And, uh, you know, this is uh, somewhat a hot field. So, you, you know, uh, I think only uh, a couple months ago, um, you know, um, well, it said 2022, but I think um, this may be an early release. They, they have a new updated release. So um, uh, streaming engine Red Panda has um, declared that they would have WASM to build, um, build into their product. You know, so the idea is really to have the messaging queue and the processing live on the same place because used to be they are separate. The Kafka server and the Flink server are two separate servers. One manages the messaging queue, the other processes the managing messaging queue, right? But with the WASM serverless function embedded into the messaging queue, you can do lightweight processing right there. So one of the uh, use case examples is that, so for instance, there are a lot of incoming messages, but some of them have sensitive data, like containing password, you know, things like that, or worse, uh, Bitcoin private key, right? So you could have a WASM program that detects those features and uh, discard those messages, not to log them, right? You know, so right there, without having to spin up uh, a Flink server on the side, right? You know, so do that right there in the in the uh, in the messaging queue, right? You know, so that's um, a Red Panda's work. But the thing I want to really talk about is uh, <clears throat> we can go a step further to say we can we want to use Wasm to do log processing in the in a, um, uh, in our say large deployment of Kubernetes clusters. So. The current state of art, or the current state, is that the ELK stack. I think many of you probably have heard of that and played, you know, struggled with that. You know, it's a stack of Elasticsearch, Logstash, and uh, Kibana. Those are three JVMs. Those are JVM applications. And of course, you can't de directly deploy JVM applications in a, in, a, in a cloud native cluster. You have to wrap them around in Linux containers and VMs. So that blows their size to, you know, hundreds of megabytes. And, uh, you know, um, so it's a, it is a very popular stack, but it's also, in my opinion, very slow, right? You know, so um, this is actually one of the huge bottlenecks. If you look at uh, leading internet companies, so you know, one of the guys that we work with, um, they have uh, 2,000, 3,000 machines processing locks. Of course, they have uh, 700, you know, they have over a billion, um, you know, uh, MAUs using their platform. You know, there's, uh, but you know, the, the cost that's incurred by just processing those logs and uh, in the new era of, you know, people want all their data to do machine learning and, you know, things like that, it's even more costly because you can't really, because you want to save those data, you want to more deeply process those data, right? You know, so it's, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a challenge that's, that's, that is very big, you know, that's, um, sorry. So how does um, Wasm help here is that instead of having those three containers for its JVMs and the process data, can't we have lightweight containers? Uh, written in Wasm that is much fast, that is much faster and much smaller, to do something mundane like processing logs, right? So this is the project. That's exactly what we did with one of our. Um, so, um, by the way, uh, I'll give a, sh a shout out to uh, Linux Foundation uh, mentorship programs. That's you know, so they get uh, graduate students from all over the world to work on um, you know, uh, Linux Foundation hosted projects. So this is one of our graduate student interns. Um, he came up with the whole solution. And, uh, um, and uh, so it's sort of like Google Summer of Code, but did the, did the whole project, right? So in this project, you know, um, as you can see, he wrote uh, a Wasm application that start with the uh, database bin collector or the pod log collector, you know, so collects a log hook up with a database or hook up with uh, a log file in a, in a, in a, diff um, in a different container in the same pod, right? <clears throat> Collect those, um, those uh, logs and then with those logs, he implemented the components to pass those logs and aggregate them and then process them. With each step, there's a way 
to um, plug in your own logic, right? You know, so um, Wasm is uh, ultimately an application development platform. So it provides, um, you know, if you think in Java terms, it's an abstract class that divides in here. So you have to provide your own implementation. But in Rust terms, it's the traits, right? You know, so you implement those traits and compile it with uh, with the existing application. You add new features to it, right? So you know, um, that's uh, he did all this in Rust. So he so this. So this is an overall diagram that's you know that's uh, allows um, the application to uh, start a very lightweight uh, Wasm application, Wasm container, and then use it to process all this data, right? You know, so um, the URL, uh, the the GitHub repository to this, um, you know, let's list it here. It's under the Wasm Edge organization. It's called Logflex, and uh, if you look at, um, it works out of the box. So it has a configuration file that's, um, that you can just simply use because the, by default, it just collects those logs and then sends them to a database, right? You know, that's, uh, so, you know, so it collects a bin log from MySQL and, you know, so it's a configuration file the application reads. And then it specifies where to collect the data, where to, uh, how to combine the data, and uh, what's the format for the output to, to, to send out, right? You know, so, so um, I won't have time to really demonstrate this, but, you know, that's, um, but when you see that, you, um, you get the idea, right? You know, that's uh, get data from MySQL and output Redis or output to Kafka, you know, something like that, right? And, uh, but like I said, the most interesting thing about it is that um, this, this project, if you're a Rust developer, you know, this allows you to define your own uh, logic in terms of how the data is being processed. So an important thing here really is that, you know, you implement this trait and uh, you, can, um, you, you compile this trait with the, um, with the Wasm Log Flex project. You get a new Wasm file, and uh, then you deploy, the new, uh, you deploy this Wasm file into your Kubernetes cluster. Now you don't need those, um, the ELK stuff, right? You know, don't need the three JVMs plus three containers plus the operating system and everything. You just have one um, you know, very lightweight, um, perhaps two, three megabytes sized um, you know, um, um, a Wasm application where you know you can uh, you can start in your in your in your pod and and start to collect all those data, right? You know, so this is uh, one of the examples, and uh, um, I'll go a little quicker because I only have eight minutes left. So we talked about how to get data and how to um, you know um, um, process the log. This is one project. So I want to move on to the next project, which is also done by one of our Linux Foundation interns. So she, she is also a graduate student. And uh, what she did is to um, solve the problem of how do you get the source of the data? You know, because the, the, the source of the log data typically come from, say, um, you know, um, uh, like in the previous example, it's uh, come from the, the um, the MySQL green lock, right? But a lot of system level data, increasingly they come from eBPF. So you have an eBPF program, you inject into the uh, kernel in the, uh, that runs the host operating system, right? You know, and then you start to collect networking level data so that when that data get emitted, you can have the, the stack that I talk about instead of the ELK, but I have Wasm file to process that. But to deploy the eBPF is, uh, is one of the pain points that we we have identified. That's you know that's we we are working with um, some um, you know cloud native companies that's that, that are doing this work, right? You know, so today, without Wasm, there's really two ways to deploy a DBPF. One is to integrated control plane. You know, that's essentially you start a container to deploy it, right? You know, that's uh, and the other one is that you, you have a sidecar, you have a EBPF daemon. That's um, you know things uh, project like Bumblebee and things like that. So those are the two existing um, uh, deployment models, but they all have problems, you know. So for the integrated deployment, you have to start a container with the operating system just to deploy a eBPF agent and manage the life cycle of that agent. Just think about, you know, whenever I, I see those, I think about the waste it generates, right? You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, all you need to do is deploy something, but instead you have to start a container to, to do that. And the container need root access because, you know, it's, uh, um, because the Linux security model is that you know, uh, nothing or all. You can't have finely grain access. You know, you have to, if you want to inject something into the kernel, you have to have that root access, right? So this is one of the problems with integrated deployment where you, know, you, have, um, you have a dedicated uh, Linux container to manage this process, right? You know, so um, then on the other side is a sidecar deployment. Sidecar deployment is um, um, because that's a process you have to run in the pod. It's a lot less flexible. It's a lot more intrusive to the uh, to the Kubernetes system itself, right? You know, so 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those two deployments. I'm just saying there's room for improvement, right? You know? So the idea of room uh, improvement is really to have the eBPA deployment container not be a Linux container, okay, but a WASM container, so something like this. Oh, sorry. Huh? I think I'm missing a slide. Okay. Well, yeah. So that's the, the red one should be um, a WASM container that has a, a, what we call WASI extension for eBPF, meaning that uh, there is a, a set of system calls that's specifically scoped for deploying eBPF agent and collect data from those agents, right? You know, so um, the project itself is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is here. So there's a library and tools, you know, you have your existing eBPF program and you use the, the, the tools provided here to compile them into WASM, right? And then you use uh, um, a WASM Edge plugin which provides those host functions into the, into the WASM runtime, into the WASM container. And then the WASM container would be able to take that WASM file, uh, strip out the eBPF stuff, and inject that into the kernel, right? You know, so it's uh, complete the whole process. You know, I'd really, um, again, I'm running out of time, but I really encourage you guys to um, try this. I think this is a really nice way to, um, you know, to, to deploy eBPF. That's, um, you know, that's, that's, um, you know that's, that is lightweight and that's more manageable, yeah. So, you know, so here are some of the, um, you know, um, um, benefits, you know, that's, it's easier, faster, but, you know, we already knew that, you know, that's, uh, we, I keep, I talked nonstop for like one and a half an hour to say why this is better, faster, either, right, you know, so. Um, there's um, one last thing we want to talk about is that there's another way of streaming processing. Streaming processing is called AI. You know, the AI applications are just data streaming. If you think about the ARM applications, they're just, you know, you, you inject prompts and then you get some data back and then use that data to call function, you know, something like that. When Wasm Edge first started, a lot of our customers use AI on the edge, meaning that's the AI in the camera, AI in the car. You know, those are all data a stream of image data, right? You know, so you uh, do processing over those. And uh, the idea is, I'll skip forward. So, you know, so we have a, a project called Llama Edge, which is an application that built on top of Wasm Edge that allows um, a true cross-platform compatibilities for those AI applications, meaning that I write towards the WASM API, and uh, once, I, um, once it's compiled, I can deploy it to any device, be it Intel, be it AMD, be it NVIDIA, be it Mac, be it ARM, you know, anything. The WASM runtime figures out what is the underlying runtime it's gonna use and what's the GPU it's gonna use, right? So it's gonna, um, so the, the, there'll be one binary that being orchestrated across the entire edge network and the, the, the uh, cloud network by Kubernetes. So, um, yeah, so there's, uh, uh, there's, I'm gonna share that in a slide. So, you know, is there something you can go, go to the hotel and try it, you know, that's, it's gonna download a large language model where, uh, on, your own, on your own computer and you can try it, right, you know? So, um, again, those, uh, the third time, those are also built by our interns. Thank you. So, you know, um, our interns have built a PyTorch extension to Wasm Edge, meaning there's, uh, there's not, no Python in there, but the PyTorch C library and the PyTorch C API build that into Wasm so that from, from Wasm you can use Rust or Go or JavaScript to call those Py, um, PyTorch functions. They build TensorFlow, they build OpenYNO. So it's not done by the same intern, it's done by um, over, uh, over the span of I think one and a half a year by over five or six interns, you know, so some of them build OpenCV, FFmpeg, you know, so now we can support the, the meta models, uh, the media pipe models, which is a Google set of, you know, um, uh, uh, vision and audio mod models, and even things like the ULO5, the object detection models, and, you know, things like that. So, you know, um, I think, uh, again, I'm running out of time, but there's lots of examples that, uh, uh, that you can see for this type of stream processing, not really a lot anymore, but image, data, audio, um, language, and, uh, you know, so you can, um, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, every single one of them has, you know, a CI, CD attached to them, so you can see how they run in the GitHub environment, so you can run it on your own environment. And you, yeah, that's, uh, so, thank, thank you, yeah.